So good afternoon, everybody. So welcome you all to this uh, academic extravaganza, which is uh, conducted by Elevate Pain Clinics every week, where we, uh, where we try to educate and enrich the people who are listening and the general public who would probably watch this later regarding the various conditions which we come across in a pain clinic and what treatment options do we have to treat them, okay? So coming to today's topic, it's a very commonly seen condition that is diabetic neuropathy. So when it comes to diabetes, I don't, it's, I think it's safe to say that everybody knows something about it, okay? Because I'm sure there's not a single household where, you know, your relatives or your family members, one of them may be diabetic, diabetic and maybe having this diabetic neuropathy. So what is diabetic neuropathy and what are its presentations and what can we do in a pain clinic to actually treat this? So we'll just have a look in a few slides, all right? So I'm Dr. Prashant Putran, consultant, interventional pain physician, in Alvit Pain Clinics, Bangalore. So without any further ado, I will be discussing this under the following headings. A bit of introduction, then the pathophysiology of the condition, then the mechanism by which the various clinical features are seen, which leads us to the clinical presentation and then the further the management. So there's a technical glitch, sorry for that. So coming to the introduction, so among the chronic disorders of the nervous system that involve complex mechanisms, neuropathic pain represents a major health concern and the reason for medical consultation in many diseases. Prevalence of neuropathy in patients with diabetes is about 30%, which is quite a high number. And even higher is that up to 50% of these patients eventually develop neuropathy during the course of the disease. So we have come across two terminologies, that is neuropathy and neuropathic pain. So what is the difference? So neuropathy simply says that there is some dysfunction in the nervous system. Okay? And Neuropathic pain definitely goes to tell you that the pain is arising from the central nervous system and it is usually in diabetes, it is chronic in nature. Um, Alma, would you, could you please um, mute the participants? Okay, thank you. Yeah. So let us see the definition of neuropathic pain. So now why we're talking about neuropathic pain? The topic was about diabetic neuropathy, but of course, th this is a topic which deals with how diabetes affects the nervous system, okay, and thus leading to pain. So neuropathic pain per se is now, now defined by the IASP as the pain caused by a lesion or disease of the somatosensory nervous system. And it goes to translate that any disease or any lesion which affects the somatosensory nervous system, and if it results in pain, then that is termed as neuropathic pain because it is very important to distinguish between the two major kinds of pain, that is the nociceptive pain and the neuropathic pain because the treatment is very, very different. And thus, we have to be very sure of what you're dealing, what kind of pain we are dealing with. So when it comes to diabetic neuropathy, it's a neuropathic pain, which is caused by a lesion in the somatosensory nervous system. So what is it? What are the characteristics of this neuropathic pain? It's characterized by a diversity of symptoms, including burning sensation, sharp, stabbing, pain, features of allodynia or hyperalgesia. So 
as you can see it is very very different kind of presentations symptoms and signs what we come across in a neuropathic pain that you, should, you might have come across your family members who are suffering long standing diabetics they might be complaining about this burning sensation or a prick kind of pricking kind of sensation or a stabbing kind of sensation in their feet and their hands okay so you have to understand that they are not imagining these things but it's actually happening because of the neuropathy and the neuropathic pain because of the disease per se okay and the top candidates for this for the neuropathic pain include the components of metabolic syndrome which is the the triad or you no know, the the features of who have features of hypertriglyceridemia obesity hyperglycemia hypertension and dyslipidemia okay so these people who already have this kind of uh, predisposing factors like increased cholesterol who are obese who are uh, hypertensive hyperglycemic they are top candidates who can develop neuropathy pain so now let's see how these predisposing factors actually cause diabetic neuropathy or a neuropathic pain in this kind of patients so the outset it all looks very complex and uh, we are reminded of our biochemistry days so but on the whole to simplify this is just a cell so this pathophysiology deals at the cellular level so what is happening at the microscopic level okay so we know the main uh, there are few main uh, organelles in the cell especially the mitochondria which is the uh, area where the atp the power source is produced and like i mentioned before just focus on this area so we know that the nerve has various layers first we have the endoneurium then the perineurium epineurium and the perineurium okay so this is a structure of a myelinated nerve so we do have myelinated nerves and unmyelinated nerves okay so what the upper half of the screen shows that what is happening at the microscopic level and this is the, the lower half the picture shows that what happens at the macroscopic level okay so i said cells okay and the major cells which are involved are the neurons so the nervous system the nerve, the cells of the nervous system are the neurons okay so especially in diabetes other especially different types of neurons it could be the glial cell it could be the uh, the swan cell it could be the astrocyte all these cells are affected so just in the previous slide we mentioned that there are certain predisposing factors like as you can see over here uh dyslipidemia triglycerides and free fatty acids so what happens this is mainly seen in type 2 diabetes okay so this forces the glucose component to go into a different kind of metabolism which is not the normal metabolism okay they go into different pathways and then finally they lead to something called as increased glycated products and a, a stress called as osmotic stress which can lead to dna damage or it can lead to mitochondrial dysfunction it could lead to cell death and loss of certain important neurotrophic signals which are important for the cell growth so what we have to understand here is this is more more in favor of the type 2 diabetes so in type 1 diabetes there is um, you know there's lack of insulin so there's a different kind of pathway which leads to neuropathy in case of type 1 diabetes so what you have to understand is now we know that there is cell death and dna damage so why why is there repair happening that is because of the loss of this neurotrophic signals which are required for the cell growth and repair so once the damage is done there is no repair happening okay so you can understand the phase where there is extensive damage to the nervous system but no repair happening okay where is it happening macroscopically is at this uh, cells which could be the vascular endothelial cells or could be the glial cells or could be the swan cells which form the myelin sheath it's nothing but a covering for the peripheral nerve it's like you can imagine like a 
insulation over an electrical wire, which is very, very important. So you can imagine if the insulation goes off by uh, bits and pieces at places, then there can be short circuit. So similar kind of phenomena occurs, okay? Like there is cross uh, talk over and all these things which will uh, come in the further slides. So microscopically at the cell, there is cell damage and there is no repair happening. Microscopically, you can see what all cells are affected. So these are the cells which are actually involved in the transmission of various signals in our body. The touch, the temperature, even the pain, pressure and all these things, okay? So, again, and we know diabetes, the main core uh, pathophysiology is hyperglycemia. So, increased glucose content. So, increased glycated products. You can, uh, you know, see it in HbA1c as a marker. So, what happens? So, this is a normal pathway, okay? Normal pathways which are required to production of various important uh, biochemical factors in our body. But hyperglycemia will derail all, all these things, okay? Finally, leading to vasculopathy or mitochondrial dysregulation, protein dysfunction, also inflammation, vasculopathy, and loss or gain of function, which I said there is no repair, okay? And makes the cell very vulnerable to other stresses, okay? So again, macroscopically on the right-hand side, if you see, this is how the healthy nerve and blood vessels look, and you mind you, even the nerves, they require blood supply. So there are microscopic capillaries, which are uh, we call as vasa nervosum. So they are nothing but the vessels which supply the nerve, okay? So the nerve also requires important ingredients for its function. So these, uh, there is occlusion of these vessels. So you can imagine that there is no nutri nutrition to the nerve. So even diabetic neuropathy is also called as the cry of the dying nerves. All right. So you can see what is the damage which is happening over here. And here they mentioned that damaged unmyelinated nerve fiber and here damaged myelinated nerve fiber. All I want to say that based on that is diabetes doesn't spare any of the nerves. Okay. Be it myelinated, unmyelinated, everything gets affected on the long run. This I would say is a very important slide because of late it was thought that diabetes, diabetic neuropathy only causes peripheral issues. So as we saw in the definition, neuropathic pain, somatosensory lesion disease of the somatosensory system, mainly the peripheral nervous system. But here also somatosensory system also involves the central nervous system. Okay. So till now in the in these in the in slides. In the previous slides, we saw how it, uh, what happens at the microscopic level, right? Where the ion channels, the receptors, all those things are involved and the cells which are involved, like the swan cells, the macrophages, the microglia. So what it, what it causes? Intraneural inflammation, spinal inflammation, spinal disinhibition, synaptic modification, axonal instability, peripheral hypersensitivity. Too many terms. But what does it lead to finally? Metabolic stress and axonal degeneration. So, another important component of diabetic neuropathy is degenerative neuropathy, non-compressive neuropathy. Okay, that make that's the hallmark of diabetic neuropathy. Okay, so ultimately at the cellular level there is metabolic stress. So that leads to synaptic modification. So now we have come to the synapse. So from the peripheral nerve we have come to the central nervous system, the spinal cord, and finally, thus leading to reorganization of the cortical and network connectivity. So finally, we have reached the cortex. So as it is true in any chronic neuropathic pain, even diabetic neuropathy finally leads to cortical reorganization. Because it is very important, it's like an imprint, it's like a memory. That is why the insult of the memory remains. And that is why most of the therapies uh, which have been tried for diabetic neuropathy are not that successful because of this memory or the imprint which is left back behind, okay? Because of the initial insult, that could be the oxidative stress because of the uh, vascular occlusion, because we know, uh, we know that diabetes causes retinopathy, glomerulonephropathy, okay? 
So today we are dealing with neuropathy. Okay. So just specifically related to the nerves, but nerves not alone. They are also uh, uh, affecting the nerves by affecting the blood vessels which supply the nerves. So occlusion of the vasovasorum, uh, lack of nutrition, metabolic stress, and all these things what you see in this slide. Okay. So <clears throat> when it comes to neuropathic pain, there are certain classical mechanisms. Okay, so there are central mechanisms and peripheral mechanisms, and the, and the most important term is sensitization. Okay, now what is the sensitization? Okay, it's like whenever there is a normal receptor which responds to a normal stimulus, that receptor's threshold is decreased. So it can respond to a subthreshold stimulus, and in chronic neuropathic states, they respond to some other stimulus also. Like patient can have pain when you touch the skin. Okay. So a non-noxious stimuli is appreciated as pain. This is nothing but allodynia. Okay. So you can see it's not a simple condition. So it takes time for such a huge de what is it, derangement of the somatosensory nerve system. And how does this happen? Okay, peripherally, the ectopic discharge, the factory conduction, somatosympathetic coupling, and nociceptive sensitization, which you already described. Somatosympathetic coupling is where the, you know, uh, the somatic, somato, so the sympathetic system and the somatosensory system are separate. But there will be cross links between the two. At the, it could happen at the spinal cord level, it could happen at the dorsal root ganglion, it could happen at the higher centers. Okay, so there is a lot of crosstalk. We know that there is laminae. There are laminae in the spinal cord, the recent laminae. So each laminae has its own nerve fiber coming and sitting on it. And from there, the information passes on to the higher centers. Okay. So there is crosstalk between these laminae. So as I said earlier, a touch is felt as pain. Okay. So all this is. Uh, again, again, if you simplify, it comes to the basic uh, understanding that whatever function a nerve has to uh, do, it is responding to some other stimuli. So all these things, you know, are contributing to that. Okay. So that was the periphery at the central, again, spinal cord, anatomical reorganization, the A delta fibers, again, they act, uh, they, they are conducting pain. Okay. And the laminae 1 and 2, which are not supposed to, are the, the, the wide range, the WDR neurons, they are responding to pain. So, a lot of crosstalk is happening. The main feature is crosstalk over there. And it could be explained because of various things. And, <clears throat> and this finally leads to spinal cord hyperexcitability. Okay. Again, nothing but you have to understand that the threshold has been reduced. So, it can respond to any stimulus. Okay. How do they present with when so many things are happening inside in the nervous system or inside the body? So, how do they present? So, and why does this happen? It's because diabetes can damage the peripheral nervous system in many ways. Okay. But the most common presentation is distal symmetrical polyneuropathy. So, distal, so the distal parts of the body, especially the hands and the feet, commonest you would have seen. Somebody is complaining about pain, uh, tingling and numbness in the feet or in the hands, in the palms, right? So it's symmetrical. It's affecting both parts of the body. It's distal and the term is polyneuropathy. It's called as DSP. Patients with distal symmetrical polyneuropathy typically have one of the more following. That is, they can have numbness, tingling, pain, or even weakness, okay? And it is associated that numbness, DSP associated numbness can cause balance problems, which can lead to falls. Okay. So it can lead to a misinterpretation that there is something happening elsewhere and it may not be related to diabetes if you do not have the understanding of this. Okay. So the, the, the patient will consult various specialists regarding the same. But yeah, the core point will be the central nervous system, the nervous system which is affected by the diabetes, which is causing all these symptoms, okay, which could be numbness, 
tingling pain or even weakness so these are the various peripheral presentations of uh, diabetes diabetic neuro diabetic neuropathy where in the first figure over here this is what we just spoke about that is the distal symmetrical polyneuropathy affecting the palms and the feet okay here in this figure we have a single dermatom which is involved and a sort of a plexus involved in the lower limb so this is the plexopathy or the radiculopathy pattern is what is seen and sometimes it can even mimic a herpes zoster kind of uh, situation where imagine this is the uh, thoracic dermatome and one particular dermatome is involved which is classic in herpes zoster uh, 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 up the uh, post operative neuralgia or uh, the acute phase of uh, zoster infection so there is pain you know the features there is pain numbness tingling which is very common to both the conditions so which gives us the very picture that we have to rule out certain other things as well so this is the mononeuritis uh, multiplex kind of a presentation where a part of the uh, limbs are involved here the upper limb we can see the ulnar involvement here the radial involvement and uh, similarly in the lower limb and then, and i would say this is the most important thing that is the autonomic neuropathy so as i said diabetic neuropathy doesn't spare any nerves so till now we saw about myelinated and unmyelinated now the sympathetic system is also involved that is autonomous autonomic nervous system okay so which plays a very important role and everybody uh, should be aware about this and how to evaluate for this because they could be in any one of these phases and evaluating for autonomic dysfunction is very very crucial so as i as we saw the plexopathy where it can involve a plexus of lower limb or upper limb and radiculopathy so you can see how it can be similar to certain presentations like a lumbar pivd or a cervical pivd wherein there is a dermatomal in or dermatom involved and there is pain excuse me there is pain tingling numbness is kind of overlapping features over here okay and the mononeuritis uh, neuritis multiplex and the mononeuropathy which we already saw all right so small fiber predominant neuropathy is increasingly recognized pattern of involvement and typically is an early manifestation of peripheral nerve injury okay so what i will say is if you can pick this up that there is a small fiber involvement then you can stage the disease okay but it becomes very difficult to actually uh, diagnose at this level because the examination which involves uh, testing the reflexes uh, the vibration sense and the motor and the sensory evaluation as well as electrodiagnostic testing can be normal in this case okay so what it goes to say that it, it is easily missed out so again autonomic neuropathy is a small fiber neuropathy it's really common in patients with diabetes and as you saw in the picture there was uh, the heart and the ga gastrointestinal system was highlighted so the symptoms including gastroparesis constipation urinary retention cardiac arrhythmia erectile dysfunction all these can be present as well so when we deal with the patient we should evaluate as a whole and not focus only at the pain aspect because when you are treating the patient is going to be with you right you will be treating the patient and there could be in any stage and in that stage it could be at any level so to minimize the complications and to provide benefit you need to have a thorough evaluation okay so coming to diabetic neuropathy neuropathic pain so till now it was about diabetic neuropathy now the specific component called as diabetic neuropathic pain which occurs in about 10 to 20% of the diabetic population overall and in about 40 to 60% of the patients with documented neuropathy so that means if they have this tingling numbness weakness there is a 40 to 60% chance that they could develop this pain okay all right even without that there is a chance that 20 to 10 to 20% of the diabetic population can develop diabetic neuropathic pain which is characterized by 
burning, electric stabbing sensations could be with or without numbness. Okay. And diagnosis of painful diabetic neuropathy in praxis is a clinical one, relying on the patient's description of pain, symptoms which are distal, symmetrical, and associated with nocturnal exacerbation. Each one of these points is very, very important. Then it should be distal, symmetrical. It's almost like the DSP component, but there is pain. Now there is pain which is uh, exacerbated in the nights, that is nocturnal exacerbation. So coming to the clinical examination. So now we have spoken to the patient. The patient says, I'm diabetic for so many years. And uh, you also have to evaluate for the other existing comorbidities of the, you know, the metabolic syndrome. And then per se, if you want to evaluate for the motor and the sensory evaluation of diabetes, the diabetic neuropathy, we do the following test. That is test for touch. The uh, any uh, sensation, touch sensation, which is done with the monofilament, okay? So, and the uh, specific sites, which is, which is uh, normally tested, because we know that the feet is co most commonly involved in diabetic neuropathy, okay? And this is for the vibration sense, where you use the, you know, 128 hertz tuning fork on the bony prominences. Even the malleoli, you can keep it the malleoli, or you can, you know, on the toe as well. And we do have to check for the reflexes. And the reflex is always an arc, right? It starts, there is a stimulus given, and then there is an afferent limb and an efferent limb, and that is how it uh, completes the reflex arc. Why it is important? Because, again, we are talking today about diabetic neuropathy. But when the patient presents with tingling, numbness, weakness, we also have to rule out radiculopathy, which is totally not related to diabetic neuropathy or the diabetic radiculoplexopathy, one of the presentations of diabetes. Okay. So, dermal uh, testing, which we already did, and then now the reflex testing. Okay. Because again, S1 dermatome is commonly involved even in the radiculopathy, lumbar radiculopathy, PIVD scenarios. So, we have to see and you can always, you know, support this by sending for nerve conduction tests. Okay. So, <clears throat> it's diabetes not only involves the nerves, it also involves the blood vessels, where there is a lot of occlusion. Okay. So, uh, entity of ankle brachial index also is important because when, as I said, as we evaluate, you should evaluate the patient as a whole. So, is, is, the, is the patient uh, has a predilection for develop gangrene of the foot? Not only that, that the foot is, is complaining about tingling numbness over there, but can he develop gangrene? So, you need to have a, a good idea about this ankle brachial index according to which it is scored and less than 0.5, if you know, it says that there is severe peripheral arterial disease with impending gangrene. Okay. And then the other tests like the autonomic test. We are assessing for the autonomic neuropathy is to evaluate the blood pressure in different positions and the ability to sweat. Electromyography to measure the electrical discharge in the muscle because myopathy is also there. Monofilament testing, you saw it is for testing the sensitivity to touch. And as I mentioned, nerve conduction studies to measure how quickly the nerves in the upper and the lower extremity conduct electrical signals because neuropathy, plexopathy, axonopathy. Okay. Transmission like a wire, you know, there is a response time, right? When you switch on the switch and the light is on, there's a response time. So similarly, when there is a stimulus, there's a response time uh, when how you perceive it in your, uh, in the brain. So has that been hampered? Okay. So how, what is the status of that? All these things will come to know with the help of the now conduction studies. And then there is an interesting quantitative sensory testing is to assess how nerves respond to vibration and changes in temperature. This is more of research aspect wherein they have evaluated various uh, newer kind of treatment uh, for the treating, uh, when it comes to treating diabetic neuropathic pain and to see the, how efficacious they are. Uh, is there any change or not by having two groups, the control groups, okay? Um, 
so was there any change after pre and after that uh, a particular treatment was given so more of a research tool is what is qualitative sensory testing or also it is uh, you know taken as part of the assessment when you assess the patient as a whole so coming to the pain assessment now we assessed about the history we uh, sort of uh, seen how how much is the neuropathy but when there is pain how do you assess so there are different uh, what is a questionnaires or different tools for that commonly using the numeric rating score where it is rated out of 10 10 being exact you know uh, excruciating pain zero being no pain and five five being average so based on that we uh, rate the pain and then specific to neuropathic pain we have neuropathic pain symptom inventory or the modified brief pain inventory or the neuropathic pain questionnaire lance pain scale and magill pain questionnaire this is a pretty long one we have the short and uh, shorter version of it as well wherein uh, you know the different modalities of pain you know the, the whole aspect the entire uh, different different areas how it is affected like the mood the ability the quality of life all these things are affected which can also be uh documented well with the neuropathic pain impact on quality of life questionnaire and then we have because when you suffer from something like a uh, neuropathic pain for a long duration you can as well it is safe to say that the it affects the cognition and the mood of the patient okay so that is why you use certain other scales like the hospital anxiety or depression scale to assess that on the phq9 scale so coming to diabetic neuropathy symptom score so we have a scoring where there is you know diabetic neuropathy or not okay where you can have this common symptom if there is unsteadiness in walking numbness burning aching pain or tenderness in the legs or feet which is absent or present that is how it is scored if it is absent is zero or is present is scored as one and prickling sensations so you can see that we can summarize that the patient has diabetic neuropathic symptoms if it is just more than or equal to 1 okay fine so any of these features now why do these features are there you have already seen unsteadiness in walking why should there be unsteadiness because they can be in all the plexus so there can be a plexopathy and or could be myopathy related to that which is causing all these symptoms okay numbness burning and prickling sensation you have seen it is a part of the neuropathic pain uh, complex neuropathic pain pattern so obviously differential diagnosis should be taken into consideration because it can be seen such similar presentations can be seen in peripheral vascular disease or it could be an arthritis involving a particular joint major joint could be malignancy could be alcohol abuse where in directly there is you know it is affecting the metabolism of vitamin b12 okay and also spinal canal stenosis which can the patient can present as numbness from the waist down below which is relieved on you know forward bending and aggravated on walking and things like that so you should have asked specific points regarding that particular condition to finally rule out the condition as i said it's a clinical the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis okay all those tests and all are just other supportive measures to for your diagnosis and also a note on no conduction studies because they are particularly important to exclude other causes of pain example entrapment syndrome because so far you have seen it's like a dermatomal pattern can one of the presentation could be a derm one dermatome involved or multiple dermatomes in so it could be because of no entrapment also which can be ruled out with no conduction studies so on the whole in general you could or ask for a full blood count crp for the inflammation again like hbnc to see the control and how it responds to therapy because we need to start them on all these agents which uh, you know for glyc there could be this should be strict glycemic control and you can evaluate for liver function tests creatinine clearance b12 folate again to rule out certain things and thyroid stimulating hormone tests so coming to the management so there are certain things which should be told to the patient as general management overall like talking about diet 
talking about exercise, talking about their glycemic control. Okay. So when it when you talk about glycemic control per se, type one and type two, and how each of them present with pain or neuropathy, glycemic control is very good in case of type one diabetes. You used to say that if you have a strict control over the on the, 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 the uh, strict glycemic control, they, the progression to neuropathy and uh, pain can be uh, controlled or it could be reversed as well. But in case of type 2 diabetes, the studies are not so much in favor about it. But again, glycemic control definitely forms a part of the treatment option. It has to be. So coming to the pharmacological management, so we will see what are the various drugs which we have in our armory where we can use, which can treat this such a complex neuropathic condition. And then certain uh, uh, aspects about the infusion therapies, where which, which is which targets specifically onto the, the tingling and the prickling and the burning sensation the patient complained about, which is nothing but the neuropathic pain component and uh, the hyper excitability component, which how we can uh, with the help of these infusion therapies, help the patients. Okay. So again, evidence to all particular uh, treatments. So this is on diabetic neuropathy, clinical manifestation and current treatments, uh, published in a Canadian journal. So broadly, they classify like, is the patient confirmed? Like you have confirmed diabetic, this patient has diabetic neuropathic pain. So the first line drugs will be the tricyclic antidepressants, okay, or the SNRIs, the serotonin, norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitors, or certain voltage-gated calcium channel ligands, okay, which are the dopaminergics, okay, or and we wait and see whether there is effect or partial effect. If there is a partial effect, then you try for the combination of these uh, first line drugs. If no effect, you try another group of drugs. Right, you switch over from three CAs, you switch over to SSRIs, SNRIs, or then on, on to carbobendinides, probably. Okay, after that, if all three classes and combinations are be fail, then second line they say that you can try for very weak opioids like tramadol. But uh, remember, this is nothing like monotherapy of this, you have to have a polytherapy where you combine the first line and the second line drugs. And along with it, very important is the glycemic control, the lifestyle modifications, okay, and the diet, and which include the diet and the exercise. So this is the European comparison between the European Federation Neurological Society's Task Force and the American Academy of Neurology, wherein they have given certain green signals to certain various drugs which we use okay and then there are certain uh, indications uh, uh, regulations where certain medications should not be used okay so as you know that a means that it is it is the drug is established as effective b means that it's probably effective and c is it is possibly effective okay so on the top we have the gabapentinoids uh, and the pregabalin, which are the voltage gated uh, ligands. Okay, so they have proven to be effective, and these are the, this is the first line drugs what we usually start on that is pregabalin. And then we can see that there are anticonvulsants like sodium valproate, ox carbamazepine, which are used. Then, as we saw, the SNRIs also have a very favorable uh, recommendation over here along with TCS. But TCS again, since the patients are elderly, we have to be very cautious with certain uh, side effects like the orthostatic hypotension or the cardiac arrhythmias or sedation, constipation and things like that. These have to be duly explained. So we move on to something like the serotonin, norepinephrine, we have to give it a scenario, especially duloxetine. So I would say pregabalin duloxetine combination works out really well in case of diabetic neuropathy. And uh, opioids, if you have to go, you have to, uh, you know, like weak opioids have a very good recommendation over here uh, in the European uh, Federation of Neural Societies, whereas it is recommendation B, according to the American Academy of Neurology. 
and certain isosorbide sprays, local spray are also recommended. Whereas looking patch, which had a favorable recommendation previously, is possibly effective in the current recommendations. Okay. So now we saw the medications like uh, so how much to use, when to titrate, how to titrate, and how to carry on with your treatment. So when it comes to gamma painting, the starting dose is around 300 mg twice daily to up to 600 mg four, uh, four times in a day. So you have to titrate. On a general rule, you wait for two weeks. Okay. So the rule of titration is whenever there is you know, the onset of side effects, obviously you titrate down. And if, similarly, if you don't see the therapeutic, uh, um, you know, uh, levels manifesting in the patient, then you titrate up, okay? So maximally you can titrate GABA up to 3,600 milligrams per day. We do not have to go so high in the Indian population because definitely they will be having the side effects of GABA the like they could be having pedal edema, they can be sedation, um, somnolescence, uh, nausea, vomiting, which have to be explained to the patient and also told that it could be temporary and uh, lasting for five to seven days and then they, uh, the body kind of, kind of gets used to it. So there has to be somebody along with the patient monitoring them, okay? Because mind you that these are all elderly patients, so they have to be care taken care of because diabetes itself can predispose them for falls. As you saw, because of the involvement of the plexus, the plexopathy, the weakness. Again, you are giving a medication which causes sedation. So, predisposing them to falls is more. So, they have to be under care. This has to be uh, thoroughly explained to the patient as well as the patient bystanders. Okay. And uh, the TCA, the amitriptyline, again, uh, start with an MG, can titrate up to 100 MG. But again, TCAs are very, very. Uh, notorious for their side effects, as I mentioned, the orthostatic hypotension, the sedation. Uh, this has to be taken care in case of elderly. Riloxetine is quite well tolerated, which uh, again started as 30 mg OD, and you can titrate up to 60 mg OD, maximum of 120 milligrams per day. So other commonly used like opioids, if you see tapentadol, extended release, it can be started at 100 milligram twice daily, so maximum of 500 milligram in a day or tramadol 50 mg QID to 400 mg per day. And you slowly titrate up to 50 mg, daily, which leads to the maximum dose. Okay. Uh, lower concentration of uh, capsaicin cream, again, is recommended. But again, uh, when you apply this cream itself, the substance P uh, that is released and uh, it, uh, the, it causes very local inflammation over there. There's a lot of local pain which the patient uh, doesn't usually tolerate. So not very commonly used in case of diabetic neuropathy. So till now we saw the medications which are trying to reverse the, the said pathophysiology what we saw earlier. But the main focus again is hyperglycemia and the metabolic syndrome. So you have to sort of control those factors and also add on these medications which will help them to tide over the crisis of neuropathy and neuropathic pain. And coming to the certain newer things like the use of intravenous lidocaine which we, which we do in our pain clinics where an infusion of these medications along with a combination of certain other medications is used which is very well uh, documented and uh, the good recommendation with the certain uh, randomized placebo control uh, control crossover trials, wherein this uh, the neuropathic symptoms, the especially the pricking, the burning uh, sensations, kind of uh, kind of respond very well to these intravenous lidocaine infusions, which can be done performed very safely under uh, proper monitoring, and uh, they don't have fixed set protocols as of now, but uh, um, each one of us, each of the pain clinics have their own protocol for this and uh, we have seen it working very well in patients with uh, painful diabetic neuropathy and uh, which is kind of along with that, of course, we have to talk about the, the glycemic control and things like that. And there's also an entity of insulin neuritis. So 
how much to control how much glycemic strict glycemic control to maintain is again a controversy so again it is titrated as along as and when the patient is required so the dictum is don't focus on one treatment it has to be from all sides including you know psychological support also to the patient okay so multidisciplinary approach has to be the core in case of managing such patients and uh, the future directions the, as i said the components of metabolic syndrome including the pre diabetic state and the potential risk factors for developing neuropathy and uh, what are the factors identify them and kind of don't let them advance into such a painful diabetic neuropathy kind of state and they have obviously it requires a lot of study and uh, so that we have newer directions and uh, newer therapies to treat diabetic neuropathy these are my references